Church in San Diego. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about those organizations before we get started. Um, they are both the sponsors for this um, second session of the Freedom All San Diego Political Education Series. Uh, first, I just want to welcome you all. Thank you for being here. Um, we're really excited to hear from our panelists today and also um, for your support in coming to our um, political education series. Um, and if you came to our last one, um, thank you for coming back. Um, so first off, um, the Freedom All Co um, San Diego Coalition is um, a coalition of organizations and activists, um, individuals as well, based in the San Diego Tijuana region who are committed to affirming migration as a human right. Um, to achieve this, we are building um, towards a world without cages, border walls, armed enforcers and institutions built upon a foundation of white supremacy. Our work starts with closing um, the Otay Mesa Detention Center and freeing them all. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about Detention Resistance, um, which is another collective, which is an abolitionist, non-institutional, autonomous collective who is organizing in a accompaniment with migrants, refugees, and those who have been criminalized by the state. In Detention Resistance, we focus um, our work largely around Otay Mesa Detention Center, providing aid, um, aid, but also working to close down the center itself. Um, we have a lot of folks here on the panel today from the Detention Resistance Collective and um, as well as volunteers. Um, so our panelists, um, for, so for today, just a little bit of the Zoom logistics is, um, this will be recorded. Um, so we just wanted to let you know that we will be recording. However, it would be likely that your little square won't be recorded. Um, what is going to be recorded is the main person. So for example, the person speaking, um, such as myself right now, is being recorded on only my frame. Um, and the breakout rooms will not be recorded. So do not worry that once we go into the breakout rooms, those are not recorded. Um, Please use the chat function um, as you would like. It's available for us to communicate throughout this event. I see everyone saying hi, and it's really cool. Um, so feel free to say hello in the chat, um, where you're from, where you're coming from, if you're from an organization, um, or to ask any questions and just have conversations in the chat as well. Um, and we also have the raise your hand function for the Q&A section. We will have um, a couple Q&A sections and during those sections, um, we ask you to use the function of raising your hand on the Zoom so that we can take a stack um, and keep kind of the questions and comments in order as, as people are, wanna speak. Um, so if you could use the Zoom um, functions, that would be great. You can also put tell chat if you'd like to speak, if you're not able to find the raise your hand function. Um, yeah, so um, on behalf of Freedom All San Diego uh, Coalition and um, Detention Resistance, we welcome you to this event. Now I'm going to introduce the panelists before I hand it over to Dr. Gen Dennis Childs. So um, Dr. Dennis Childs is a professor at UC San Diego and he um, is an abolitionist and he will be, um, he also works with students um, to end mass incarceration and he will be um, speaking with us today and facilitating the Q&A sections. We also have with us um, Genesis Hernandez Sanchez, who will share her testimony of migration um, and experience detained at Otay Mesa Detention Center. We also have Alex Guzman for Detention Resistance, who will be translating for Genesis. We have Isabella um, from Border Angels as, um, as a water drop leader, but she is also a part of Detention Resistance, um, particularly our letter writing program. And we have Ruth Mendez from Detention Resistance, um, who is a phone team member there. And we have Oscar um, Giovanni Nevarez Diaz, who will also share um, his experience at Otay Mesa Detention Center. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you so much. And I'm going to hand this off to Den um, Dr. Dennis Childs. Hello, everyone. Um, buenas noches a todos y todas y todas. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to the organizers, uh, Detention Resistance, and everyone else involved in organizing uh, this event and others. Um, I've been following uh, what the organization has been doing in terms of shutting down the OTI uh, Detention Center, concentration camp, whatever you want to call it. And um, I'm just appreciative to be involved in the conversation. 
and I also see some um, some old school uh, friends and compas and the group of people that are here. And I just appreciate everyone who's here. And I particularly want to thank Alexis for the invitation and the organizing. Um, so uh, I guess I'm going to get us started off. I think I have about 15 or 20 minutes uh, and uh, I've been tasked with uh, to quote uh, what I was told from the group, a theoretical background to issues of incarceration, immigration, and abolition, to speak on how we can bring together the prison abolitionist movement and the migrant justice movement. Uh, that is no small task for 15 or 20 minutes. So I'm going to do, do my best in terms of offering something, hopefully, that will be useful uh, to everyone. Um, and uh, so in that light, um, I just wanted to start off with some words from a compa that I know many of you know that I heard recently, um, and it was one of the uh, Platicas de Sexta Griegas del Norte, um, and Imoat offered some words that I thought would be very helpful um, for our conversation tonight. She said, no solidarizamos con el CNI, um, the Indigenous Congress de México y el Movimiento Zapatista, no solo por solidaridad, porque nuestra lucha es la misma. Para resistir, resistir capitalismo multinacional, nuestra lucha también tiene que ser multinacional. Su lucha es nuestra lucha. Um, nuestra lucha es la misma. I think that is a really good uh, kind of grounding for what I have to say uh, and what I have to offer and also hopefully for our, our larger con con conversation. Um, and in that light, um, it's just interesting to think about why we need to talk about how we can form uh, connections and links of solidarity in the first place uh, between, say, the, anti the movement of anti-Black racism and prison abolition, for instance, on the one hand, and the movement for migrant justice on the other, or Black and Brown solidarity. Why do we need to have a platica about how to do that um, at this point? Um, and I, I do, I, I, I want to say, and I, and, and I know there's maybe some translation going on. Am I speaking too fast? Um, um, we're not going to translate um, all of it. So we're just okay. going to translate when Genesis speaks from Spanish to English. Okay. Um, so, um, so the question is, well, why do we need to talk about possibilities for solidarity? Um, if 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 it's true, and I think it is true, that the that our struggles are indeed shared struggles. They're not they're not exactly the same, of course, but the same roots of settler colonialism, neo-colonialism, imperialism, slavery, heteropatriarchy. They're connecting every, all of our struggles. Um, you know, the, the the situation since 1994 with the the coming out of the EZLN. Those things have been grounded since 1492, of course, and for people of African descent, we use the year 1619 just as a kind of device to get conversation going. Of course, the transatlantic slave trade predated 1619. The 1619 refers to when the first slave ship carrying Africans came to Jamestown, Virginia. Uh, and so why the need to continue to talk about how to form uh, solidaridad, uh, a sense of collectivo? Um, first of all, it hasn't always been the case that we needed to talk about it. We have uh, foreground, foregrounders and forerunners um, during what's often called the movement era in the 60s and 70s, groups like the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, working in coalition and solidarity with groups like the American Indian Movement, the Brown Berets, the Young Lords, white radical organizations, the Red Guard, an Asian American radical organization, so at the height of the movement, that notion of third world collectivo was something that was not something that needed to be strategized on. It was actually an action. And this is not to say, mind you, that there are no organizations that are working for brown black solidarity, but there has, from my um, standpoint, been a relative ebb um, and, and a lot of others. Um, and one of the things that I think I can offer by way of a, uh, hold on one second, please. Um, I need to handle one thing, just one second. My dog was sleeping in this room and apparently she didn't like my um, my introduction here. <laughs> so, um, so 
there was this there we do have a platform to go on with these organizations that I just named. And, and mind you, again, I'm not saying that there's no such thing as solidarity across these lines or these artificial lines. A lot of the people that are on this Zoom, I've worked with in this capacity over years. Um, but I think we can all agree that there are some important uh, things that we, lessons that we need to take from that movement era. And one of the things that I would like to offer in terms of my own work, uh, I, I wrote a book called Slaves of the State a while back that some of you may know about that talks about the relationships between chattel slavery and prison slavery. Um, and also talks about the, the long uh, African abolitionist movement. And uh, in that work, I, I tried to outline how there is a, a real process of disinformation by the settler colonial slaveocracy with respect to the category of criminality. And one of the main ways that that disinformation works is by disassociating, specifically I'm gonna talk about black criminalization right now, disassociating black criminalization from its moorings in the mass legalized kidnapping of Africans and enslavement of Africans uh, before 1865. So that ship that came to harbor in 1619 wasn't just a slave ship, it was a prison ship. The barracoons, the slave fortresses, or what were called factories on the west coast of Africa, the, the slave pens in which Africans were held bef uh, before they were taken to market and sold on auction blocks and turned into commodifying, commodified objects instead of human beings, human subjects. Those were all in the plantations that they were then um, sent to and kidnapped to. All of those amounted to a carceral system, a system of incarceration. But even though that is, you know, for a lot of us, and you know, I'm I'm basically quoting or paraphrasing the lead anti the black lead black radical abolitionists, um, specifically in the a writing capacity, like Asada Shakur, like George Jackson, like Angela Davis, like Robert King Wilkerson, like Sekou Odinga, and the list goes on and on from there. In saying that, the current prison industrial complex is nothing if not a, an extension, a continuation of the original prison industrial complex called chattel slavery. So I think that that's really important for us to think about. And the reason why I describe this in the context of a campaign of misinformation is that when you look at the zillions of hours of coverage of so-called crime in the United States, you will find very little, if any, mention of what I just said for the last eight or 10 minutes. And there is a will to disassociate again what's going on now from what went on back then, so, supposedly. So slavery is supposed to be like in the dinosaur age, uh, a kind of prehistory. But those of you that have seen Ava DuVernay's film, 13th, know that even in the amendment to the US Constitution that supposedly outlawed slavery and supposedly allowed for the freedom of 4 million Africans in the US, there was an exception clause that allowed for African re-enslavement. And why was that exception clause written into that document of so-called so liberation? That exception clause was written in there for very particular purposes, which was that the South needed to industrialize itself after all of the damages of the Civil War, um, putting in railroads, roads, mining, also, the former plantations didn't become former plantations. Many of them today, for instance, in places like Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, black people labored in doing slave work in the same fields that our ancestors labored in all going back to the to the 16th, 17th century. So this is this is a you know, so one of them is called Angola that I write about in Louisiana, um, which which was a, a slave plantation that is now greater in size, 18,000 acres than the island of Manhattan that was converted into a state prison after so-called emancipation. And guess who got sent there to do the same kind of labor that they did before the passage of the 13th Amendment? Former slaves. So you had the birth of what was called prison slavery. So a re-commodification of black being. Um, and this, if we take that as a starting point, and you look at the period between 1980 and 2000, where you had a 500% increase in the incarceration of people in the United States. 
um, to the point whereby the early 2000s, we had 2.3 million people incarcerated in the US. If you don't understand those origins that I just started talking about, then you will fall for the misinformation campaign that brands black people as natural born criminals, quote unquote, gang members, thugs, welfare queens, and all the modes of demonization that have been put into play to rationalize a system of legal disappearance, legal kidnapping, organized torture, et cetera. And so if we wanna talk about solidarity, we can start by talking about solidarity and conditions. The relationships between what we're seeing now in terms of uh, the process of forced sterilization that migrant women have been dealing with, and the fact that forced sterilization has been a common carceral practice in the United States since its inception. Shackling women who happen to be pregnant to their beds while giving birth to babies. This is something that happened to Asada Shakur during her political imprisonment, by the way, and the birth of her baby Kakua, Kakuya, who is now a grown woman. And this is something that happened to a lot of women all the way until very recently that is shackled births until it was finally outlawed as a practice along with forced sterilization. You have to ask yourself, how can it be possible that forced sterilization needed to be outlawed by the legislature of the state of California in the 2000s? Um, the fact of the matter is that's a rhetorical question, again, with groundings in the genocidal practices of slavery um, and um, the settler colonial occupation of this, of, the, of this land that we're on. Um, so again, the tendency is to read all, th all these things as a part of history. But when you look at the situations faced by migrants, the killing not only of, of Black people in the streets, like, you know, Breonna Taylor, uh, George Floyd, Tamir Rice. I mean, my dad was also murdered by police when I was seven years old. Um, a lot of my compas know that who are on here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In 1979, my father was shot in the back five times by a police officer, and there were no handheld cameras anywhere to record that. So this is something that, again, goes back to 1619. It is something that my family has endured through what um, Jamaica Kincaid calls in reference to her definition of history. For her, history is like an open wound that reopens with every breath. So the, the movement to stop the core civic uh, detention center, the concentration camp, is connected directly to the struggle to end the prison industrial complex as a whole. And I'll just end by saying, uh, how much, how many more minutes do I have? Like two, one? Um, yeah, you can take a couple more minutes if you'd like. Okay. Yeah. I just want to round this off somehow, because um, I have a lot to say, obviously. But the death of my father, I figured out the, the murder of my father at the hands of the state um, in terms of the impunidad y criminalidad de Estado is something, the criminality of the state, state terrorism is something that is collectively felt by people across borders. Um, and that's something that I think that, you know, the words of the combo that I began with really points out. But I just wanna say that, you know, in a, as a word of caution, as we get to the, to the panelists, um, you know, and as we think of the connections between black, brown, indigenous, migrant, um, imprisonment, premature death in the U.S. settler colonial slaveocracy and elsewhere, that we pay attention to the words that we use. So in the struggle against the, the facility in Otai, you know, I've been seeing, and, and those like it, I've been seeing on the part of, and not a part of detention resistance, which is doing this work, but a larger uh, problem within the discourse of migrant justice, using phrases like, they are getting treated like criminals. They are not criminals. Um, who is being described with the word criminal in those phrasings? We have to be very cautious about that because you, in rehumanizing those who are being dehumanized in places like the Otai de Detention Center, we don't want to further dehumanize those that are thought of, again, according to the fictive principle of white supremacy as natural born criminals and people who, quote unquote, deserve to be treated like that. Uh, so I think organizations like Detention Resistance, I know you invited my compa, uh, Curtis Howard, to, to take part in an action at, at the Otai Detention Center. I think that we need a lot more in the way of, of conversations like this in order to seek out the relationship between a group like Detention Resistance and a group like All of Us Are None, are none that he's the head of. 
so that we can stop the treating of solidarity as a kind of rhetorical device and actually put it into a real practice along the lines of what Fannie Lou Hamer said when she was speaking to a group of well-intentioned, uh, uh, you know, mostly white feminists at a women's organization meeting. And she said, none of us are free until all of us are free. So that's all I have for now. I wanted to go ahead and open it up to the panelists. And I hope that was something that could be uh, fruitful for further conversation as we move forward. Uh, I'm wondering uh, who we might, Alexis, can you help me with who I'm passing yeah. the mic to? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, Dr. Dennis Child, for sharing all of that knowledge and very necessary context for this conversation. Um, I think just as you said at the end, um, these are some opportunities for us, like this, this, it's this dialogue itself that we're having here um, is trying to open up that conversation. And that's why we invited someone like you to pose those types of questions for us. Um, thank you very much. Um, we can have uh, Oscar go first. So what we're gonna go um, on with right now is we're gonna hear uh, five minutes from Oscar and then five minutes from Genesis um, about their um, whatever they would like to share with um, you all, the audience, about their experiences, particularly their experiences at Otay Mesa Detention Center. Oscar and Genesis were both formally detained there and um, they were both um, in contact with detention resistance. So they have a longer relationship with um, members of our collective and um, yeah, I'll hand it over to Oscar. Go ahead and introduce yourself and go ahead and go into your five minutes. Um, first of all, thank you guys very much for having me this evening. My name is Oscar Navarez. Mi nombre es Oscar Giovanni Navarez Diaz. Um, I was just released from... Oscar, you're, is, you're cutting off, so you might want to turn off the camera so that it won't. It's a detention center on October 20, about 14 months fighting my convention against torture. Yes. Okay. Is that is that a little bit better? Yes, it's working better. Go ahead. Hello. Um. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Hello again, everybody. My name is Oscar Navarez. Um, I was after spending a collective 14 months. I'll start. Um, basically, I just spent a collective 14 months fighting my asylum or convention against torture case in Otay Mesa Detention Center. And there's just a few points that I want to um, touch on really quick about what it is like to be in a detention center like Otay Mesa. Um, thank you very much for having me, first of all, and thank you to uh, Mr. Dennis. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to share that my, the whole point that I wanted to make is that the immigration system is a system that is built to break people in every respect. So from the time you get put into detention, it's something that is emotionally, psychologically, and financially taxing. Um, it is basically a system, ICE detention is a system that is profitable, a profitable system. Um, that basically profits on human suffering and family separation. So it's a system that's built to basically make you lose from the very beginning. It's a system that's built to break you as an individual. Um, it separates people from their families. It makes it so difficult because a lot of people in the detention center, um, first of all, there's a language barrier that a lot of people have to deal with. Uh, secondly, Something that a lot of people do not know, I believe, is that in detention, you do not get afforded um, an attorney to help you with your case. So the chances of you winning your case are actually very, very, very slim. Um, it's like going, you're basically going up against a seasoned um, immigration, like government attorney with you having no knowledge of immigration law. Um, and like I said, it's, it's something that's made to basically ICE makes profit of detaining people in prolonged detention where these people are, are mothers. These people are, give you, they take mothers who are bringing their children who are seeking help from this country. And they're 
they're trying to escape a situation which they're coming from in their home country. And instead of giving them help, they make it as hard as possible for them to have a fighting chance to win their case. So what ICE does is the immigration system is built to where if you do not have, if you're not, if you don't have the money to get an attorney, you have to fight your case on your own. Um, all the meanwhile, you are not having any kind of income, you're separated from your family, and it's very hard for you to get in touch with the outside world. Um, I think that what organizations like Detention Resistance do is, is something that you can't really put a price on. It's, it's actually priceless. It's invaluable to all the people who are in there because before I met the people from Detention Resistance, I felt like I was in detention completely alone. I felt like I was I felt like nobody cared basically. Then somebody told me about this place that I can call and I began speaking to people like Ruth Mendez, like Alexa Guzman, like Imoat and Roberto and all of these compas who I've, I've gotten close to over this time that, I've, um, that I was in there. They actually, they do, they do so much for people that are, that are detained or incarcerated, you could say, because it's not really a detention center. They, they call it a detention center, but it feels more like a concentration camp because they treat you worse than is if you were a prisoner. Um, actually, me and a friend of mine named Rael Andal, we decided to write a book while we were in there um, so that we could let the world know what it's truly like to be detained behind the walls of a detention center where you have no psychological help for, for people who have mental health problems. You have no medical care where you have everything against you. Everything is basically stacked against you to make it near impossible for you to have a fighting chance to get out and be reunited with your family. When a lot of people are being held in detention for crimes they committed over a decade ago, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Why? Because ICE and immigration make money off of this. These for-profit detention centers make money off of human suffering and I just think that the whole point of the book is we wanted people to be able to read it and eventually we feel as if if one person can be helped to be released from detention if one person who is maybe not part of an organization right now or who is not doing something to help hears this or people who are listening now even um, we need I guess more people to step up and be part of, of the movement of trying to help people in this situation, in these situations of being detained. Um, I think my five minutes is up. I just wanted to share that with you guys really quick and um, just thank you for everybody that is part of an organization like Detention Resistance and Border Angels and um, like Alex Mensing's also his organization. They do so much for people. Thank you for LOP, for my, Lawyer Harper Otaka, who, who was also, she was amazing and helped me basically regain my freedom. Um, without people like you guys, um, I would probably still be in there. So we need more people to step up. And I guess this is what this is all about. Thank you guys very, very much for um, having me and for your time. I appreciate you and God bless. Thank you, Oscar, for sharing um, your testimony. Uh, we'll be hearing um, a lot more from Oscar as well in the Q&A sections, um, and there's some follow-up questions we're also gonna have. Um, but thank you for um, sharing a little bit about um, your experience as well as um, the conditions inside and what goes on inside. Um, I'm gonna now um, hand it off to Genesis. Um, uh, Genesis uh, is um, going to speak in Spanish, but Alexa Guzman is going to translate for Genesis. So, um, Genesis, tú sigues, um, y cuando estás lista, um, puedes empezar introduciéndote y luego a uh, los cinco minutos en lo que tú quieras uh, compartir con la gente aquí ahora uh, sobre tu experiencia uh, de migración o de entre, entre lo que pasaste en uh, la detención de Otay Mesa. Ok, buenas noches a todos. Mi nombre es Génesis. Este, pues yo soy de entre, lo que pasé dentro de una detención por ser inmigrante, por alzar la voz, por, es, um, como, por sí, por alzar la voz, por no quedarme callada, por no contagiarme de COVID. Estuve es, um, siete, um, siete meses en prisión. 
y después de ahí de alzar la voz por lo del COVID, este, me metieron un mes al hoyo por no contagiarme del COVID para hablar todo por lo de cómo nos tratan dentro de una prisión. Y pues yo creo que es muy feo cómo nos tratan. Y pues... Si me permites, um, vamos a dejar que Alexa traduce, um, traduce eso y luego sigues. Ok. Okay, uh, so Genesis said, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Genesis. Uh, I just want to share what happens inside for being an immigrant, uh, for speaking up, uh, for not staying quiet, uh, for not getting um, uh, COVID. Uh, I was seven months in prison uh, and I was sent one month to solitary confinement for speaking up. Uh, as retaliation, and uh, I believe it's uh, very awful the way in which they treat us inside. Okay, síguele, um, Genesis. Y por ser una mujer trans, este, estuve con 285 hombres alrededor mío, y pues yo creo que no es justo el cómo nos tratan dentro de, de una detención, el cómo nos hacen, cómo nos discriminan, seas lo que sea, seas mujer, seas hombre, seas madre de familia, seas lo que seas, el trato es diferente para, es igual, perdón, para todos. Oh. Um, and for being a trans woman, I was surrounded by 285 men. And it is not fair how they treat us, uh, everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a man, if you're a woman, if you're a mother, uh, they do discriminate and the, uh, the treatment is very bad for everyone. Puede seguir, Jen? Jen? Creo que no es justo el cómo nos tratan porque no nos merecemos eso. Se supone que somos... Uh... Eh, emigrar no es un delito, emigrar pues es para luchar y sobrevivir en varios países donde no hay trabajo, donde no hay, por eso emigramos a, a, a este, esta, esta ciudad, este, ciudad de Estados Unidos para luchar y para salir adelante y pues para darle un futuro a nuestros hijos, ok, y no, no, no somos unas personas que venimos a hacer daño, que venimos a causar un problema, venimos a trabajar para sobrevivir o por personas que hemos pasado por delincuencia en México, yo soy mexicana y pues que he pasado delincuencia y por mi vida emigré acá y pues como me tratan dentro de la detención no, 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 no se lo merece a nadie porque somos humanos, sentimos, sea lo que sea, religión que tú quieras somos humanos y pues sentimos, pero no es justo que nos traten como, como, como nos tratan dentro de una prisión cuando te, te arrestan. Alexis. Sí, sí, está bien. Um, ¿Quieres que traduce Alex? Uh -huh. uh, it is not fair the way in which they treat us. Uh, to immigrate is not, it's not a crime. Uh, we just do it to survive. Uh, to feed our kids, we are fighting, we migrate. Uh, we don't come here to harm anyone or cause any sort of problem. We are here to work. Uh, I'm a Mexican and uh, I had to flee my country because of problems with the law. Uh, and it is not fair uh, how, how they are treating us inside the detention center. Y pues yo creo que yo, si estuviera, tuviera un poder para, para poder no, no hacer algo, porque el cómo nos tratan, yo creo que a nadie se lo merece, a nadie, a nadie es, es para estar ahí, somos personas. Y pues yo creo que, en mi opinión, yo diría que lucharemos para cerrar esos, esas detenciones para personas e inmigrantes que venimos a luchar y a sobrevivir y no, no, no este, quedarnos abajo, morir en la pobreza o quedarnos sin que comer. Por eso emigramos y esa es una opinión para las personas que me están viendo. Yo lucharía y voy a luchar porque esto es lo que yo quiero, cerrar todas estas detenciones, el cómo nos tratan. 
Um, in my opinion, uh, nobody deserves that uh, to be detained. Uh, we are all people. Uh, in my opinion, down. I'm gonna keep fighting to shut them down. All those places. Sí, y aparte de, de todo el trato, el cómo, cómo te, te, la comida, la comida que nos dan, el cómo nos tratan, no poder este, comer sopa al maruchan todos los días, este, comer sardina todos los días, este, estar dentro de una detención donde no puedes ver a tu familia, donde no puedes hablar con tu familia, donde tu familia no sabe de ti, y si le llamas puedes... 10 minutos, 15 minutos, o sea, no es justo de cómo nos tratan porque venimos a un país a, a, a luchar y a demostrar quiénes somos porque sea lo que sea, no nos vamos a quedar callados por nada del mundo y por nadie del mundo y vamos a luchar y por esto vamos a, a ir más para cerrar esas detenciones. Um. Yeah, the whole treatment, the food, not being able to to eat proper food, eating sopa maruchan, it's like instant ramen every day, uh, sardina every day. Um, you are not able to speak or see your family. If you call them, it's only for 10 minutes. Uh, we, come, we come to a place to fight, to show who we are, and we are not going to stay quiet. And that's why I think it's important to keep fighting to shut these places down. Sí, y aparte de eso, la comida, el tomar agua de la llave del mismo, del mismo, del mismo excusado casi, porque pues es la misma agua donde va. Entonces también no es justo como el trato de eso, de la comida, eh, como te, como, cuando estás en la hielera, las mentadas hieleras, 15 días, 20 días te avientas ahí sufriendo un frío que a nadie se lo deseo con una cobija de plástico realmente es de plástico yo no cuando yo decía yo no lo creía y lo viví y es una cobija de plástico está sentada por 24 horas en el suelo o en una banca de, de fierro y no es justo eso tampoco de verdad oh uh, yeah uh, also we were uh, drinking water from the uh, what like pretty much the same water that they use for the toilets. Uh, they put us before they send them there to the detention center, they put us in the Yelera, which is a cold room for 15 to 20 days with only a plastic blanket. And they force them to be sitting down uh, for 24 hours on the ground or on a bench, which is made out of metal. Um. Genesis, te queda como un minuto y medio um, de hablar y quería um, decir si querías hablar sobre un poco de la huelga de hambre um, y por qué lo hicieron o de los niños de detención, lo que tú quieras. Ah, pues la huelga de hambre, este, bueno, es un poquito de largo, pero para no hacerlo tan largo. La huelga de hambre salió por mí, por otros compañeros y pues al último me sacaron por ser como la líder del tanque, por hacer huelga de hambre, porque no nos hacían caso. Había muchos contagiados eh, en el tanque, 54 contagiados cuando nos dijeron en nuestro tanque. Después yo les dije a mis compañeros que no nos teníamos que quedar callados porque pues... Nadie nos escuchaba más que las organizaciones y si no fuera por ellos, yo creo que yo no estuviera aquí porque pues sí me apoyaron mucho y la huelga de hambre se hizo por lo del COVID y por no, no hacernos caso. De hecho, yo duré en el hoyo 48 horas sin, beber, sin comer algo y pues la comida que, que me daban pues era un, un pan un pan y una, un pedazo de bolonia y, y unas semillas y esto. Entonces, por eso hicimos huelga de hambre porque, por lo del COVID. Y pues por eso salí y pues cuando salí, pues no salí con, ba, ba, salí bajo palabra, pero con un grillete en mi pie. Y pues por lo de los niños también, de verdad, no es justo. O sea, me imagino cómo nos tratan a nosotros. Si somos grandes, podemos defendernos, podemos decir algo, pero ahora un niño, si nosotros nos desesperamos, 
Ahora me imagino un niño de brazos, de, de meses, un niño imperativo. Si nosotros nos desesperamos, me imagino un niño, eso no es justo tampoco. Y de verdad, luchar poder cerrar esas detenciones de los niños, porque hay niños que ahorita salen en las noticias que no, hay niños que no encuentran a sus padres por culpa de esto. O sea, no es justo eso tampoco, de verdad, que, que se haga prisión para los niños. Los niños no tienen la culpa, no, los niños no saben que los padres lo traen acá para ser alguien en su futuro, para no vivir lo mismo que ellos. Entonces son niños y la verdad no se merecen eso. Um, yeah, we did a hunger strike because of uh, the pandemic. Uh, uh, they uh, got me out of the detention center because I was a targeted leader of the pod. Uh, they wouldn't hear us out about or worries about COVID. Uh, they were uh, 54 people in my pod uh, who tested positive for COVID-19. And I was the one uh, organizing them and letting them know that we shouldn't stay quiet and we should speak up with the, with the organizations. Um, and because of that, uh, they, uh, I got some retaliation. They punished me. They sent me to uh, solitary confinement. Uh, everything I was given to eat was a piece of bread and a piece of bologna with some seeds and I believe that thanks to that uh, is why I was able to get out um, under work. I don't know how exactly how to translate that um, with an ankle monitor. Uh, and I also want to speak up about the kids in detention centers. Uh, I just want to say, I can't imagine how they are treating them. If us as adults, uh, we get desperate. Uh, I can't imagine uh, kids that are, some of them are months old. Um, There's kids who can find their, their parents and it's not their fault. Their parents only brought them for a better future for them so that they don't go through the same that they went through when growing up and they don't deserve this. So I think we should keep fighting to shut these detention centers down also for, for the kids. Uh, gracias, Genesis. Um, eso uh, va a concluir esta sección, pero vas a tener um, las preguntas que siguen en la otra sección y también um, Um, cuando tienen preguntas um, lo, los que están aquí. Pero ahorita vamos a um, seguir con um, las preguntas a Ruth y a Isa. So we're going to continue with Ruth and Isa. Las preguntas que le vamos a dar a Ruth y Isa son de um, qué, qué significa la palabra solidaridad para ti y cómo se ve solidaridad en um, práctica. Um, so the questions we have for Ruth and Isa are, what does the word solidarity mean to you? And what does solidarity look like in practice? So we'll go ahead and hand it over to Ruth. Hi, thank you. Um, gracias, Genesis, este, por um, tus palabras y tu testimonio. Um, first of all, well, solidarity to me means seeing beyond the division. Um, seeing the commonalities that we all have. Um, and I know the tension resistance does this work, you know, through our hotline, through, um, through all of the acompañamiento that we create with the relationships we build with the compas that we are in constant um, uh, communication with through letter writing as well. Um, and that is, uh, And I uh, just love what that means to me. Um, from the beginning, as Oscar mentioned in his testimony, we know that like ICE and CCA and prisons and all these places isolate. That is their, that is the way they break people down. Um, so in many ways, you know, all of our relationships with compañeros of listening to their, how their day was um, or things like that, we, um, that all of those relationships are a form of resistance. Um, so for me, that is what I, um, yeah, that's just to answer, but um, yeah, if we're really putting into practice, you know, when we go and protest or just when we speak um, and say, no están solos, like you are not alone. Um, I know I, I'm with attention resistance mainly on the phone line. Um, so that for me has been a way to really 
verbally let them know that they're not alone or compas and that there's a whole community um, even uh, behind them and with them um, through their journey. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Ruth. Um, thank you for all the work that you do all day, every day, answering phone calls um, and doing everything that you do that no one knows. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Isa. Isa, we have you answering what um, does solidarity mean to you and um, what does solidarity look like in practice? And you can speak from either um, both of your kind of affiliations with um, Border Angels or with Detention Resistance. Hi, everyone. I'm Isabella. Um, gracias, Genesis y Oscar, uh, for your testimonies. And thank you all for having me here. Um, and thank you all for all the amazing work that everybody here does. Um, so I will, I'll talk about what solidarity means to me and then uh, talk about it mostly in the context of what we do for Border Angels. So solidarity for me has uh, two components. So it's a sort of, it's an awareness and it's an action. So it's, it's an awareness and knowing, um, it's, it's a concept of, you know, no one is free until we're all free. Like um, Dr. Uh, Denise, Dennis Child um, requoted, uh, it's, it's knowing or being aware that we're a community or not individuals and our success um, really depends on everyone living their best life. So um, solidarity is understanding, being aware that we're all equal. It shouldn't be hierarchical while still being also aware that there is a lot of privilege and systemic inequality that tries to break that sense of non-hierarchy and, and community. Um, and there's many examples of solidarity. Uh, Ruth uh, does an amazing job at that with attention resistance. Um, but in terms of my role for Border, Border Angels, so I've been a, a rally leader for Border Angels for over two years now. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Border Angels uh, water drop program, which is what I lead for, we go to the desert pretty much every weekend now during COVID to drop supplies to people crossing through the desert. Um, and this is our way to show solidarity by supporting this cross this crossing. It's a it's a statement that we don't believe in borders um, and that people should be able to migrate freely across land. Um, and, and with that, I'll say that the land that I'm talking about is, is Kumeyaay land, right? There has to be some um, recognition of that, of that land as well. Um, and it's also sending a message of we're not gonna let this dehumanizing process win. We're not gonna let the government impose this, you know, the tension, um, the terrence, uh, prevention through the terrence, sorry, um, and, and pretty much allow people to, to die and suffer. So it's, it's telling the people crossing that we, we want you here, you're part of our community, and, and together we're better. So um, our way of, of showing solidarity, although there is a lot of inerrant um, inequality because of our situations, like the people dropping the supplies and, and the people picking up the supplies, it's still our way of saying, we really need you to succeed here. Like you deserve to succeed here. You deserve to be treated uh, humanely. And, and we, we see you, we recognize you, and we really want you. We want you to, to, to succeed. That's it. Thank you, Isa, um, for all you do with Border Angels and Detention Resistance for the life-saving work you do by going out in the desert to leave supplies for folks who are crossing, as well as um, the moral support, emotional support that is so necessary to this movement um, that you contribute to with the Pen Pal program as well. Um, so we're going to um, go back to um, Oscar and Genesis for a last round of questions before the breakout groups. Um, so the question for us, we'll start with Oscar again. Um, and the question, Oscar, is what can we do, um, what can um, we as activists do working on the outside to empower people in detention and support them as agents in their own liberation? Okay, good evening to everybody once again. And I believe that to answer that question is that I believe that detention resistance and these other organizations who are doing such amazing work, they're already doing that. Um, the other, the other 
Oscar, um, I think you should try turning off the camera again so we can hear you better. We can do. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Um, good evening to everybody once again. Sorry about that. I'm having uh, difficulties over here. But um, I believe that what we can do out here to help people in detention is exactly what detention resistance and these other organizations are doing. Um, I just want to talk about something real quick that they helped me do while I was in detention. So Senor Carlos Escobar Mejia, whom we all know his story, I believe he was in our unit. So I got to, he was our friend. I got to live side by side with him. We spoke to him every day. And what happened in his situation was such a tragedy because it could have been prevented now. Um, the work that detention resistance, the, the work that detention resistance does is because when this happened, had 46 of signed that letter. And that letter was sent out to this organization lawsuit um, against Core Civic at this moment. Um, what happened to him? could have been avoided and I, for all of those who who maybe know about the letter I know there's some that don't basically when this happened was that he was so sick he couldn't really move anymore for the last three weeks we kept telling the medical staff we kept telling unit management we kept telling the counselors we kept telling everybody the CEOs that he was really really sick that he needed medical attention um what they would tell us every time that we brought that to their attention was that he needed to sign up for sick call in the morning. So by them saying this, they're ignoring the basic human necessity of giving somebody medical care when they are in need. Why? Because ICE, because immigration, they do not see us as human beings. They dehumanize us inside of these detention centers. And he is a perfect example of of that because one life lost is too many, especially under the circumstances in which this happened. So these organizations out here, what they do, especially detention resistance in my experience is priceless. They give us a voice, they help us get in contact with people. Um, we actually sent them the letter and that letter was sent to his family and that letter was used on a couple, they actually wrote a couple of I believe like um, news newspaper articles about it. So we we brought that out to light so that the world could know what happened inside of there. But if it wasn't for organizations like detention resistance and other people like that, um, people would have never known the truth. And so I just believe that if there's anything we can do out here to help people in detention is basically do what detention resistance is doing, do what Border Angels is doing, do anything that we can to help those people inside who maybe feel like they are alone. Because when you're in there and you don't know anybody or you don't know these organizations that exist, when you first get into detention, you feel completely and utterly lost and alone. You feel like, you feel like a grain of sand on the beach and the beach is ice and immigration and you're that one small grain of sand and that's your power compared to the collective of the beach. So it's like, it's like impossible. You feel so lost. You feel, you feel so sad, you feel so alone, but these people, these organizations, they give us life in there. And that's what detention resistance did for me. All the people there, um, Alex Mensing and his organization, like ACLU, um, LOP, all these organizations that 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 step up and do um, all this work for us out of the goodness of their heart and from their own time, I think that that is amazing and it's something that you definitely cannot put a price on because my freedom is is evident is evidence of that. Because thanks to all the work that they do and all the help that I received for them, I am free today. And freedom is the most valuable thing in this life. 
So I am so grateful, forever grateful with all of the people at these organizations because thanks to them, I'm sitting here speaking to you guys tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you um, for sharing those words, um, Oscar, and um, also for um, all of the work that you did in bringing out the truth about what happened to Carlos Escobar Mejia. Um, for those in the audience who may not be familiar, um, I put a link to the article that was produced after they were able to send us the letter um, detailing um, the truth, uh, the medical neglect that took place in that pod for a very long time, as Jess um, is um, describing in the chat as well, um, that led to the death of Carlos Escobar Mejia. Um, the first death from COVID-19 in ISIS facility um, nationwide. Um, the death of, COVID, of Carlos Escobar um, Mejia weighed very heavily among the migrant and refugee kind of advocacy networks here in San Diego and Tijuana. So um, thank you so much for the work you did in um, helping us understand what happened and trying to bring justice um, for Carlos and his family. Um, I'm going to now um, ask Genesis the same question. Um, Genesis, um, te vamos a hacer la pregunta de que ¿Qué puede ser la gente? Um, ¿Qué puede ser la gente para ayudar a apoderar a la gente adentro para, um, para, como li, para sacar su liberación? Um, no sé cómo decirle, pero esta pregunta de cómo, ¿qué puede ser la gente? Pues, en realidad, ¿qué puede ser? Pues, la verdad, ayudar a que cierren eso, esas detenciones para mi opinión, porque no hay otra, otra cosa que hacer, porque yo creo que no nos merecemos eso. Y pues eso es lo que podríamos hacer y pues no dejar caer a la gente que está dentro de, la, de, de, de las detenciones, como Taimensa, como este, varias que hay en Estados Unidos, pues eso es lo que podríamos hacer y que nos ayuden a hacer eso para darle fuerza a la gente que está adentro, porque hay mucha gente que se desespera y hasta, la, hasta toman decisión de suicidio y pues no, no se vale eso. Eso es lo que pueden hacer para poder ayudar a cerrar. Esa es mi opinión, de verdad. Ok, so uh, what Genesis said is that in reality, you used to continue to help to shut these facilities down because nobody deserves to be in there. Um, and not let people who are inside, um, let them fall uh, uh, inside detention centers like Otay Mesa or others in the United States. And there's a lot of people who get desperate and take uh, decisions such as uh, ending their lives. And that is not fair. So I think we should continue to, to push for uh, shutting down these places. Um, Genesis, ¿tenías más comentarios o eso es suficiente para, para esa pregunta? Pues, otro comentario que también me gustaría decirle, que también se, se dieran como las oportunidades de, bueno, yo sé que no es fácil decir que cierren, pero a las personas transgénero, o sea, personas de la comunidad, también es muy importante porque... Um, Uh, como a mí, a otra compañera, nos mentieron con hombres eh, y pues somos chicas trans y se supone que tenemos que estar con las mujeres, pero eso también es lo que me gustaría que hagan para, para que si hay personas no, sufa, no, no suframos este, el acoso, porque yo fui acosada muchas veces se, dentro de la detención, por eso también me gustaría para que si nos ayudan a, a acomodar eso por la comunidad LGBTT este, para que no nos pongan con los hombres porque somos mujeres a pesar de que tenemos cambio de identidad y tenemos eh, cirugías o así es, nos ponen con hombres no es justo y nos tratan como hombres no es justo de verdad eso um. Yeah, I would also like to add uh, for you all to help us with the, um, uh, so, that it, so that there's more opportunities for uh, people from the LGBT community. 
uh, for example, I'm a trans woman and, and myself and other uh, trans women were sent to, to pods uh, with all men. And uh, I suffered a lot of harassment because of it. And that is not fair. Here we should be put with, uh, with the rest of the women, not with men. And uh, so, yeah, I also would like to ask for uh, more uh, advocacy for people from our community. Muchas gracias, Genesis, por compartir um, esos comentarios y específicamente um, la experiencia de como una mujer trans. Um, um, Sí, muchas gracias por como decirnos de, lo, de las experiencias y cómo es y lo que debería de, de cambiar, pues debería de, como dice, cerrar, ¿verdad? El centro, pero también respetar las identidades de la gente. Um, claro. Sí, gracias. Um, creo que ahora, um, um, I said thank you, Genesis, um, for speaking um, about your experience, but um, more specifically also to the experience of trans women in detention. Um, and like Genesis said, um, what should happen is these centers should set, be shut down, but also that um, the identities of people need to be respected. Um, so now at this point, we are going to um, transition to the breakout rooms. Um, this event was structured as um, a panelist uh, as well as um, a panel as well as a dialogue. Um, este evento es un um, para escuchar de la gente de ustedes, pero también um, para hablar con la gente aquí. Uh, vamos a entrar a cuartos um, que van a ser grupos más chiquitos. The breakout rooms will be um, smaller groups that will give us the opportunity to talk with each other um, to make sure that this event is a dialogue um, and a conversation for us to have um, with each other. So um, we're gonna move to the breakout rooms that have been um, assigned um, and we'll start in a minute, but I did wanna um, let you all know what the question is that you'll be discussing in the breakout room. Um, your breakout room will have a, a discussion leader um, and the discussion leader is from Free Them All um, Coalition um, San Diego. So um, they will be the ones facilitating. Um, so once you get into your breakout room, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And then we're going to come back from the breakout rooms in um, 15 to 20 minutes. And we're going to end with a 30 minute um, Q&A, questions and answers. Um, vamos a ir los, a los um, breakout rooms para platicar un poco más um, en grupos más chiquitos. Pero luego vamos a regresar a este grupo um, grande para, hacer, um, para que la gente pueda hacer um, preguntas a ustedes um, que uh, um, compartieron con nosotros ahora. Okay? Uh, Fatima, if you'd like to start the breakout rooms, I think it's good. So you click 